It's Saturday, April the 16th, 2022, at 8.16 a.m. here in Tacoma, Washington. This is the One Here Eighth Project's diary cast number 35, entitled, Breathe Me. For those of you who have been following my diary cast for some time, you're aware that I mix house-sitting with staying at Airbnbs and backpackers and places like that. This house sit began in mid-February, and through the end of last week, which was the diary cast period finishing for number 34, there was only one pup. His name was Josh, he was a 10-year-old beauty, and I adored spending time with him. The homeowner returned from her long road trip Saturday evening, and on Sunday, she actually invited me to go with her to the Humane Society, where she had decided to get a second dog. <laughs> I'm up for anything. (laughs) You see, the homeowner returned from her long road trip Saturday evening, and there was a layover period between then and Wednesday evening when she would be leaving for her second planned trip to New York City. I took advantage of that time and booked a hotel nearby so that I could have time to myself to simply further connect with the divine. I have to say that the homeowner worked very hard (laughs) to try and convince me to stay, but I knew in my gut that it was in my best interest to have this separation for a few days just to recalibrate. Besides, now that she had decided to add a second family member to her canine community, I thought it would be in their best interest to have some bonding time alone. And for both of us, it turned out to be an amazing opportunity. For me, I spent those three and a half days in deep, regular contemplation. I got up in the mornings, went down for my complimentary breakfast, and then returned with a cup of coffee, a couple of juices, (laughs) snuck into my sweatshirt pockets, and then knowing that I would find my way deep within where the magic happens. I actually thought that my diary cast this week would be all about what I discovered during this period of deep awareness in consciousness. What I came to find was that it had only opened me to what was to come. With hours upon hours, day after day, I went deep. During that time, the phrase breathe and breathe in and breathe me kept coming into my awareness. Of course, breathe makes sense. Breathe in makes sense breathe me in? I didn't quite get that, except for the fact that it was my feeling that I was to connect with myself. Breathe me in. Breathe in who I really am, where I really want to be. What are the questions that I have? What are the answers that I have evolved into? Things like that. It was only upon my return to the house sit Did I really get the message that was awaiting for me with that phrase? You see, the homeowner and I spent a lot of time on that Wednesday talking, walking the pups, sharing notes, she telling me about her road trip and all the places she had gone, the caverns she had discovered, the trails that she had hiked, the godliness she felt she connected to in the deep nights out in the snow-covered grounds of the Utah and Oregon ruins that she had visited, stars filling the sky, warmth filling her heart as she stayed up all night in attempts not to freeze to death. (laughs) Her choice. I seem to be her human encyclopedia to the divine. She asked me so many questions, and to the best of my ability, I answered her, caveating each one with that this is just my view, these are my possibilities, these are potential options that I'm sharing with you, just my own thoughts, so that she would then take what I was sharing with her and make it her own, not to regurgitate it as if it was the answer, because it was just my experience of the divine. One of our first conversations was about the disposal of the limb that had fallen from the tree that I talk about in diary cast number 34. 
Not only had the homeowner contracted a team to remove the debris, she also hired them to cut down the tree in its entirety. That led to a discussion about the consciousness that I feel exists within the tree community. By that I mean I had done some research in years prior when a tree on our property actually caught fire and what remained after the firefighters put it out was just a shadow of its former self. I had to decide for myself, was I going to cut it down and have it removed or was I going to leave it there? Because there was a couple of small limbs that still had life on it and I felt If it had life, who was I to decide that that life should be snuffed out? So what I discovered was that there is a vast root system within all tree communities, especially in the forest, where it's much more easily researched and documented by scientists who specialize in that type of genre. I learned through that root system, there's a communication that goes on, a sharing of knowledge, a sharing of resources, and much more. The significant part here is that when a tree truly dies, it falls over. If it is cut down, has it actually completed its ancestral role, I'll say for lack of another way to define it. In other words, there's so much knowledge and information, historical record, information about resources and all sorts of other information that the tree feels the rest of the community may benefit from. Until such time, it may appear dead to us from the ground up, but beneath the surface, it's still alive and producing. Therefore, I decided not to cut my tree down. I thought I would just let it finish this process and discover for myself whether or not the life that was still there was enough to maintain its further development. What I can tell you is that somehow, as these things happen, an actual face began to emerge or etched itself into the face of the tree where the bark had been burned away. And that face could only be seen from my bedroom window on the second floor of our property. It wasn't distinguishable from the ground and it wasn't at an angle that it could be viewed from any other location other than my bedroom window which I thought was fascinating. I have to tell you that when I would meditate, I would often face that face (laughs) for the pure joy of feeling like that was its way to give me a sense of its beingness. So of course, the conversation I had with the homeowner talked about that aspect of it and how I felt that trees have a consciousness beyond our ability to comprehend. And maybe, just maybe, the reason that the large limb fell beautifully between the two properties, not damaging anything, was its choice. Because it felt, let's say, the goodness of the environment. It was in the best interest of the homeowners, maybe, that it had come to appreciate. in however, its consciousness was able to comprehend that. Probably, if that is accurate, I would say it would be vibrational, that it can sense the frequency of the humans around it, the other consciousnesses like, you know, dogs, cats, squirrels, etc. That's only my supposition, but I'm going to stick to that. And by the way, let me caveat this by saying, once the tree was removed, nothing was damaged you could see everything. So the fence was clear on the property between the two homes. The fence between the front and the back of the property, although it appeared to be destroyed when you looked at it from any angle while the tree was still there, it wasn't. It literally had just been pushed down with the main post being bent but still in place. So all the homeowner had to do was rig it back into place with some wiring and it was good to go. It really shocked me, I have to tell you. I couldn't believe that with all the possibilities of where that thing could have fallen, that it actually did zero damage to anything except itself. Thus, the homeowner and I had a very positive, enriching conversation about the consciousness of trees. 
That led us to go on a walk. During that first walk with the two pups, she told me how the second pup, whose name is Dion, one and a half year old Yerky, I think she called it, she told me that he did seem to be 50-50 with respect to the personality traits that the Humane Society had told us he had. He is bred to be a herder, so he has to feel he's the leader of the pack. He has to feel he has a purpose. And if he doesn't feel he has a purpose, we were told that he would be a little destructive because he would be agitated that he didn't have something to do. We were also warned that he may not get along with Josh very well unless Josh was submissive. And of course, Josh is submissive. He's looking for someone to lead him. He is a born follower. So it was a perfect match. As we walked along the streets and valleys of her neighborhood, she pointed out this trait as he was displaying it and that trait as he was displaying it, showing that those were things she felt she had to work on. Apparently, the homeowners had extensive dog training experience to teach dogs she's had all of her life. And with that knowledge, she is aware of exactly what she felt Dion needed. Then, of course, later that evening, she left for the airport. That left me, Dion, Josh, to our own devices. <laughs> Long story short, Dion is a doll. He is very well behaved. He does not tear up anything. He does not need to be constantly stimulated. If you take him outside and throw the ball around, or if you play tug of war with him, for example, he's relentless. He doesn't want to stop. But the minute you let him know that you're done, he's very sweet. He will follow you, but not too closely if you ask him not to. So no matter where I went, for example, sitting at the kitchen table doing some work on the computer, he would just lay down nearby so he could be next to his human. Josh, on the other hand, was both hit and miss. He was still trying to figure out exactly where he fit in this whole dynamic. He spent a lot more time outside, but as time went on, he became more and more accustomed to having Dion nearby, and they actually began to play and bond in the yard. I took the knowings learned through those three and a half days of solitude and applied them to the tree experience and the Dion experience. And here's what I discovered. The phrase, breathe me, had to do with both the tree and the pup. The tree was breathing in everything around its environment to make a conscious choice as to where to lay its limb when when it could have dangerously fallen in a lot of directions other than where it actually landed. In contrast, I could breathe in the energy of that tree. You see, the homeowner had asked that when the tree was cut down, that it be sliced in equal denominations so that she could use those circular rounds for steps along the backyard, for decorative borders around her garden area and things like that. And I have to tell you, those slices were beautiful. The condition of that tree was absolutely stunning. So I sat with those pieces as they were close to the bottom steps off of the patio into the yard and I breathed them in and I called to the consciousness of the tree that was yet therein and allowed myself to simply go into meditation. And I received some amazing awarenesses. So this phrase of breathe me was something that was to come. It wasn't simply part of the seclusion experience. It was part of what was to potentially be offered as something I could incorporate into the rest of my life. I felt the energy of the tree and I showed gratitude for it just being in existence, its health, its choice, its beingness. It's a visceral experience that I can sense and I don't have to prove it to anyone. It's just something I can take with me in silence. The same with Dion. Dion had been labeled as something different than he was. And as a result, I was really concerned that number one, 
he may not be a good match for Josh because of what they said was his aggressive behavior. And we did see this untethered energy while he was in his cage or whatever they call those enclosures where they put all the pups. And in the visiting room, when we tried to play with him, he wasn't interested in food. He wasn't interested in us. He was only interested in playing. And to me, it seemed like he was detached from human contact or the desire to want contact. And that absolutely wasn't true. In putting things in perspective, it's clear that he just wasn't getting any exercise or attention so that when he got it, he was overstimulated. And that is how he displayed this characteristic of desire to play, desire to connect. As well, they said that they didn't want us to take him with us because we had Josh in the car at the time. And she had brought Josh because she had prior experience picking up pups from the Humane Society. And in years past, they had a policy where they would allow any current animals to visit with the potential new family member to see if it was a good fit. Now their policy has changed. They feel like the potential for exchanging diseases is too high, both to the animals in the kennel and to the dogs on the outside. (laughs) With my law firm experience, my guess is something happened in the past and someone probably claimed that their dog got whooping cough or something from the pound and probably sued them or something like that. That's how policies get changed, as I have learned over the decades. So I was quite trepidatious to add another dog to the mix, especially since the homeowner was only going to be there for a couple of days and then everything would be in my charge again. And adding another unknown element was not something I haven't done because that's (laughs) how I live my life is kind of on the edge of the unknown, but it would be my responsibility and I wasn't sure how I could handle it if there was a lot of angst associated with it. I was concerned about the homeowner's property getting destroyed, both outside and inside. I was concerned about the potential for fights and arguments between the two dogs, maybe even ending in something more violent. I was concerned about walking the pups and the interaction with the other dogs in the neighborhood of whom most of them spend their time outside and you run into them as you're walking around all because of the preconditions that were shared with us about what we could expect, as well as our interactions with Dion in the visiting room. So I took that mantra of breathe me and I applied it to Dion. I sat with Dion in the backyard as Josh was off on the side watching as people in the alley were walking by and things like that. And I looked with him eye to eye, which he was more than happy to do, And we spent a good five minutes just doing that. I attempted to try and speak with him with my eyes and my energy holding a certain vibration. And I tried to read his as well. During that time, the phrase, breathe me, came back as it had when I was sitting at the bottom of the steps with these slivers of the former tree that had done such a great job of protecting the humans and the properties in the face of high winds. During this process of breathing Dion in, I felt this camaraderie, his ease. I felt a bond that is ineffable, all from taking a moment with the mantra, breathe me. Needless to say, Josh and Dion have been such a pleasure to be with for these last couple of days, and Dion has turned out to be the exact opposite of what we were told to expect. And I'm very grateful for the opportunity to have experienced the divine in the phrase, breathe me. And for this week, I will leave it there.